Christian Church. Are you glad to be here today? Could you stand up and let's lift a hand to heaven to thank the one where our help comes from. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us everything we need to give you praise today in this sanctuary. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here under the banner of your love. Oh, Father, we came to praise your holy name. We came to give you thanks for all you are and everything you provided for us. We position in our heart to give you relentless, reckless praise and worship from the depths of our heart. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. If you would agree and say amen, Amen, amen. Let's put our hands together now. Make a joyful noise in this house today.
everlasting God. I tell you what, he's an everlasting God. He's an eternal God. When he said it, he meant it. It was finished. Amen. When he said you are healed, it was done. But maybe you're here today and you just want hands laid on you. You just want somebody to believe with you because it's strength. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, right? As we wait upon the Lord. But he's already done. Do you all agree? Our God has already done it. Amen. So if you want to come up and we're going to celebrate with you that it's already been done, by faith, come on up and we're going to pray over you. We're going to pray over you. Amen. And celebrate that that who promised, that which he promised is coming to pass. It's done. And we're going to see the manifestation of it. Amen. 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 So if that's you, come on up. Join, join this one. Won't you please? It's our honor and our privilege to stand with the body of Christ. I also have something. Sometimes, you know, it's hard for our students in school. How many of you know people aren't always sanctified? Right? Amen. So if you're dealing with somebody in school that's giving you a little bit of trouble and you just want someone to stand with you, we're going to stand and believe that can be anywhere from five years old to 35, however you are. If you're in school and a place of work, whatever that is, come on up. We're going to mix our measure of faith with yours. Amen. We're going to speak to that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
children of the Most High God. And we lift up holy hands unto him right now. And then I'll need you to help participate in something. We have a team that is going to Roatan, which is an island of Honduras. And they're going to leave here on Friday. And we want to pray over them for their trip. And uh, if you would come up, Don, if you'd bring your team up, please. Uh, come on up and just face, if you would, the front here. Just just kind of face me. Just make a just make a, a line here, if you would. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you can be seated if you want in the sanctuary. But just stay in an attitude of prayer and praise to our King. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can someone... Uh, Go get Isabel. She might be back with the children. Did they already go? We're going to wait for her. But as we were singing, I got something to say to you. And it's always good when the Lord gives it. Because we didn't come to hear this vessel, but we did come to, to hear the king. Amen. All right. So we've got Isabel, Donna, Cindy, Cynthia, Amber, and Linda. And so as, as we were praying right at the very end, before I took the mic to speak, I got this. There was this movie that was out, and I remember seeing it. it was a true story about a man and a team that went to a very native island. And they killed people that were different than them. And they couldn't speak the language. And they, it was called the end of the spear. The end of the spear. And before this young guy left, or before this man and his team left, his boy had learned the language and he wanted the dad to say this, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. Because if spears started flying, he wanted his dad to be able to say, we came in love, we're your friend in their language. And he said, dad, what if they attack? What if they tap? What are you going to do? Are you going to defend yourself? And he so sweetly wrapped his son with his arm. And he said, son, they're not ready to meet Jesus yet. But we are. We are. Now we're going to pray over you because the people that you're going to meet before you meet them, they're not ready to meet Jesus yet. But we are believing God that after you bring that divine connection to them, that they will bow their knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and they will receive Jesus. And so we send you forth. We thank you, Lord God, hallelujah, for your presence and your spirit that's among them and upon them and in them. And we thank you, mighty God, for protection for this team who is going to leave here and go to different islands. And they're going to Roatan and they're gonna bring gifts of love. And oh yes, Lord, gifts of love so that people will know how much you love them by the vessels that are coming, Lord God. And Father, we thank you that you prepare the way, each and every way. We speak blessed on departure, blessed on arrival, and blessed in every way in between. And we thank you, Lord God, for keen, keen insight that they'll know where to go, how to go, when to go, and when to pause. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I thank you that your spirit is bold in them and it rises up big and they'll speak that which they ought. And we thank you, Lord, that when they lay hands on the sick, that they will be healed in Jesus' name. And we thank you for signs and miracles and wonders that follow your word. And I thank you that as these five go forth, mighty angels will be standing at guard because they are a child of yours. Hallelujah. And you go before them. You're your, their front guard and their rear guard. And I thank you, Lord God, that you draw people to them as you're drawing them to you. And we thank you, Lord God, for a, a time of fellowship, a time of 
refreshing, but I thank you that what they put their hands to do is prospering for your kingdom's sake. And Lord, by faith, we thank you for future brothers and sisters in Christ that will change families and will change the tapestry of that island and that nation. And we thank you for those who have gone before us. We thank you for all the seeds that have been sown that are rising up big in that country. And the enemy, we plead the blood over them, each and every one, blood applied, blood applied, and the blood that's applied, we plead the blood over the ship, over the planes, over the islands, over the every area, every boat that they're on, we plead the blood. We thank you, Lord God, for the ground that they walk on. Thank you, Lord God. Now go, now go forth with joy and with singing and be bold about your love for them and your love for me. Praise God. Now let's just praise him. Hallelujah. And thank him in Jesus' mighty name. We thank him in Jesus' mighty name. Now will you turn and meet your church family that's going to pray over. Just turn and meet the family. Come on. This is the family that's standing with you, cheering you on, giving you an encouragement. Praise God. Come on. Praise God. Come on. Praise you, Lord God. And we'll commit to pray for you. And we thank you for going for going in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor John sings a song called Send Me. And um, if any of you have, um, I think it's on the album, isn't it, Pastor John? Um, the uh, album that we have, the, the CD, um, it's on there. And that's such a beautiful song because God does send us places. And sometimes he doesn't tell you why you're going, but if you know it's coming from him, that he has something for you to do for someone else. Amen? So um, I always love that song, and if you have the album, listen to it. It's a, it's a beautiful song. Um, well, it's welcome, family. It's March 1st, 2020. Yeah, do we have any first-time visitors here today? Very first time being in this church visiting with us? Please raise your hand, and our ushers will give you a little packet. Um, it's our welcome packet. Welcome to Family Worship Christian Church. This is the place where the love of God is evident, the spirit of God is directing, and we have a guarantee. If you open your heart to receive, you will not leave here the way you came, in Jesus' name. Our ushers are giving you a little packet, and inside it, it's information about our services and about our church. And also, um, inside that packet, there is something for you to fill out if, um, you know, we're a praying church. If you look around us, you're just a one step away from heaven. And our job here is to teach you how to live down, up, down here before you get up there. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to learn how to love on each other, even those that are not so lovely. And we're taught how to do that. Amen? So um, we feel free to join us after service. Um, we have a little gift to give you. And that little prayer packet, we will give it to our pastors. If you have any prayers, and we have other gifts to give you. And if you don't have a church home, this is a great place. Amen? Okay, on the calendar, number one that's going to be happening next weekend, we have um, Daylight Savings Time returns. Hallelujah. So that means you have to spring forward, move your clocks forward, okay? So you move it an hour forward so that we know that, um, so that we know that on Saturday night, so you're here on time on Sunday, amen? Um, we will be having Communion Sunday. Um, Pastor D has started the uh, Sunday morning um, faith classes, which are at 9 a.m. 
Um, and we have ca these calendars are at each entrance, each doorway. So make sure that you look at them to see what the different things that we're doing. So we first we want to remember we have the faith classes at 9 a.m. and it's a five or six week course. So it's all the month of May, March. All the way through May. All the way through May. So um, we have started, it started today and it will continue. So this is a good time to um, learn about all the different sides of faith that make things move on your behalf, amen? Um, also, the women's uh, group will be meeting on uh, the 21st, and that their uh, group is uh, Reset Confidence. Bring a friend. Um, we usually have some type of, um, they have papers and supplies for a school drive. So whenever the women get together on Saturday, they've also got other things that they are doing. Uh, doing some type of an outreach. And we have a very strong, we call them the wow women, women of the word. And they also meet on Wednesday mornings. If you're interested in um, joining them on Wednesday mornings um, in Christ loving him. Amen. I think I have everything on here, our adult classes. We also have healing schools on Monday uh, and the evening at 5 p.m. in corporate prayer. And then our Wednesday evening service, which is the hour of power. So um, there's quite a bit on the calendar for you to look at. Um, and then there is one thing that I did mention last week. We have the information for all the married couples about um, the outing that we have for spring. And over to this table, there's a sign-up sheet. There's information on it. I will be there to answer any questions that you have. But um, it's gonna be a fun time. Um, just. Uh, be open to receive, and there's a lot of different options for you. So we have all that information available for you at the table. Amen? I'm going to turn this over. Pastor D. Thank you, Millie. And I sure like that graphic that was put up there about wow and all those. Can we give a big, huge hand clap for everybody who does things in this church to make it so wonderful and great? Well, I get the opportunity to do a couple things. Uh, one, just a quick little reminder, because it is an outreach, ladies, we are doing a school drive. Years ago, we chose five schools in the area, and we heard that they had um, some shortages in their paper products. So we did a toilet paper drive and paper drive for them. But we'd like to do a paper drive and school supplies because many children that come to school may not have the supplies that they need. And you can bring that throughout the next upcoming weeks. Anything you think students might need, paper, pens, pencils, you can bring toilet paper. They'll use that as well in the schools. And then we're believing God which schools to give them to. All right? That's our March outreach. We're taking some supplies to our schools. Uh, we're, yes, yeah, so we're excited about that. If you would turn to James 4, 6, James 4, 6, please. And we're going to talk a little bit about opportunities to give. We have a couple opportunities here. We, we have missions that we get behind. You just saw a little bit about what's going on, Roatan, Honduras, and a team is going out there. If you would like to give a little bit into that for your mission giving, you can just mark that on your envelope. If you need an envelope while I'm doing this, just raise your hand and the usher will get that to you. There's some hands up. Hands up if you need an envelope for your giving. You can mark that on your check or your envelope to be able to give. If you also want to give in the by credit card, you can do that after the service in the bookstore, or you can give online, lasvegaschurch.org as well, or yeah, I think I said that right. Okay, so um, there's different things that we're doing. We have the Samoa uh, Rama South Pacific ministry that we're giving into and we're collecting and we donate on a regular basis on a monthly basis over there to get the word to go forth and uh, bible schools planted over there a good quick report uh it looks like fiji is moving right along and they've already got desks and things like that they're recruiting students so fiji Rama South Pacific is going forth too. So praise God. You sowed seed into that. You believe God. That's a reward for you as well. So, and then of course, we talked a little bit last week. Pastor John talked about a building fund. He really feels, we believe in our heart, that God would like us to have our own building that we own. How many of you would agree? 
Yes, yes, yes. And we've sown a lot of seed. And praise the Lord. Don't ever get discouraged about seed you've sown. Because the seed you sown allowed the ministry to go forth and the word to be sent out. So never, never just say thank you for the seed, Lord. I thank you that it's, that it's springing up strong. So we always say that over, over it as well. Well, we're going to start a building fund. And so we have building fund envelopes. You can seek the Lord on what you'd like to do on that area. Or you can also designate um, after your tithe. Um, you can designate uh, over and beyond what you'd like to do for building fund or for missions or whatever. That's kind of the biblical way that we're talking about. James 4, 6. Let's take a look at this. James 4, 6. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But he, who's the he? Our Lord. Come on, let's raise our hands again to him. We can't praise him and thank him enough. But he gives more grace. Therefore, more grace to who? To the humble. And I received this as I was kind of seeking the Lord on what to share today. Can we just show, uh, look at this little picture over here. You see this picture? We, we like that picture. That's kind of like a picture that we kind of see, you know, maybe what the artists depict Jesus as maybe looking like in a man or a woman, whoever that would be. It's almost like the welcome home when they get to heaven, right? It's kind of real, way, way cool. It's like that welcome home. Uh, when they get there, and I love that. If you look real closely, you can see the remnants of the scars in his hands, in his wrists, however you want to do that. But it's a beautiful sign. It's a beautiful picture, and I got that, and I thought, but before that happens, we bow our knee to Jesus. Have you all, if you're born again, if you got born again, you bowed your knee. To Jesus, wasn't that the best bow you ever met? Can you, I mean, and you do it probably regularly. I will tell you how it works with me. The Lord asked me to do something. I bow my knee, bow my will. Yes, sir. Yes, I will. Yes, Lord. Yes, I do. And I, I, I believe God to be able to quick to do that. How about you? We want to quick to be obeyed and quick to be obedient, right? But I was thinking about, I was thinking about tithing. And if you don't mind, I just want to give you a little, a little bit, because all gifts come from him. You could say grace is gifts. Grace is gifts, or grace is help. When we say grace be upon you, help, where does our help come from? Him. Comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord. We have what we have because of him. We don't have what other people may have because of him, right? He is a good God, everything. How many of you are breathing air? Come on, take a deep breath in. Ah, exhale out. Who gave you that breath? Who gave you those lungs? Who gave us the world? It doesn't take much to believe in God, does it? You can see him all around us. So we bow our knee, and each and time he asks us to do something, we can bow to that. We may not see how that will work out in our budget, but we're willing to do it in Jesus' name. So when we ask for a tithe or an offering, we're asking for a grace to be given to your account. Amen? He gives grace. And you know what? It takes humility to bow, doesn't it? Have you ever tried to bow without being humble? You just hit your foot on the floor. Or how about anybody remember being time out as a kid? Maybe you stood in the corner on the inside. You're saying, I might be standing here, but I'm standing up on the inside, right? It's not really about. But God is working with us if we're willing to be willing. And you may not see how could that happen. How could I give that tithe, that 10%? But God knows he gives more grace to the humble. Have you noticed that? And there's areas of pride he might resist, not because he doesn't love us. It's just pride in God. Don't mix. Our pride in God just doesn't mix, right? He's the giver of all life. So I would say to you today, if you're believing God to tithe 10% of your income, if you're believing God to give in to the building fund, if you're believing God to give in to missions, by faith, bow to be willing to do what he wants us to do. And what does he do? 
he gives more grace to the humble. How many of you are happy for that grace? I am so happy and thankful for that grace. Did I give you enough time to write out your checks, get your envelopes ready? You got them ready? Pastor Don, would you come on up and pray over ours? You might, if you've already given, or you give by a different method than what we're doing now, just hold up your hand, too. You might give for the whole month, however that is for you. But hold up your hand and believe God as we go. Father, we just lift these tithes and offerings up to you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We just agree with your word right now that the devourer is rebuked for our sakes. And you're opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing upon us right now, Lord God. So we claim that blessing right now, Father, in the area of our finances, in the area of our health, in the areas of our family, in our relationships, Lord God. Uh, there's no limit to what you can do, Lord God, for the obedience. So we give you all glory, honor, and praise for all the good that takes place as a result of this today. In the name of Jesus, everyone said, amen. amen.
good amen good to see everyone here today and um, as we continue on in our uh, lesson about following the voice of God or hearing the voice of God and I want to start out with a couple of statements today um, something that the Lord spoke to me many many years ago and this will help you as you ascertain to what the will of God is for your own life the first one is this um, I, I remember many years ago inquiring of the Lord for a certain situation in my life about whether um, this was him or not or this direction. Have you ever been there before? You've been at a crossroads, you know, and you're seeking the Lord for a certain direction, you know. And um, one of the things that he spoke to my heart, and I believe this will help you, and some of you may have heard this before, but um, sometimes we get amnesia too, don't we? We forget things. But um, he said this to me, and it was so life-giving to me. He said, um, my will for your life always, everyone say always, always, always leads you closer to me. So from that statement, I was able to come up with another statement, and that's this. My statement is that the will of God always leads us closer to him. Now just stop to think about that. If you would use that as your compass or your governor for even the small things in your life, it would make quite a difference in what you do or what you wouldn't do, wouldn't it? Or maybe even what you think or wouldn't think, what you would say or wouldn't say. You know, um, it, would, it would determine many things. Um, in our relationships with people, you know, and who we're going to marry or who we're not going to marry, where we're going to work or we're not going to work, the will of God always leads us closer to Him. Okay? Now, also, a second statement, kind of a follow up statement to that, and I believe this will help you too, is. Um, you know, the Bible talks about the, 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 the children of God or as many as be the sons of God, you know, are, are, are led by the Spirit of God, amen? amen? So we know we are to be led by the Spirit. So one of the things that as believers we, we don't want to do is we don't want to violate the leading of the Holy Ghost. Do you know what I mean by that? that when you have a check about something, you don't want to violate that check, nor do you want to ignore the check. Now, do you know what many people have done? And maybe you've done this, and if you have, we've probably all done this. Everyone in this room a time or two have done this, so, so I don't want to get in anybody under condemnation for anything, or to make anybody feel more foolish than the person sitting next to you because we've all been foolish a time or two, haven't we? Yes. Amen. But um, one of the things you don't want to do, everyone say don't want to do. You don't want to do this, okay? You don't want to violate the leading of the Holy Spirit as you're quoting Scripture. They might say, what does that mean, Pastor John? Well, have you ever really wanted to do something? And so you begin to quote the word on doing that. But on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit gives you a check. But you continue to move forward, quoting the word, because thinking the word is going to change this situation when God has clearly given you 
inside information that the direction you're going is wrong. If you quote the scriptures while violating the spirit of God on the inside of you, it will lead to a disaster in your life. As a matter of fact, it could cost you your life. You know, we've, we've alluded to this kind of in our teaching as we've gone on through these last few weeks here. But um, if you have a, a leading of the Holy Spirit not to get on an airplane, not to get on a helicopter, not to get on a cruise ship, if you have that leading that you say, bless God, I can do all things through Christ on the inside of me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Um, the, he that abides and dwells under the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the so shadow of the Most High. So we're quoting scriptures of protection. We're quoting scriptures of the dominance that God has given us, but we're violating the Spirit of God on the inside of us. It could cost us our life. How many are glad you're in church this morning? Amen. These are important things. You're not here by accident today. So today we want to talk to you about, and this is also very important, being in the right place at the right time. I want to talk to you about that today. Being in the right place at the right time. Because being in the wrong place at the wrong time can cost you everything. Now, many times we think about being in the right place at the right time, you know, this opportunity will happen, and there's a positive side to that, isn't there? Right? But there's also a negative side to being at the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, that can cost you your life. It can cost you all sorts of stuff, cost you lots of money, cost you years off your life. So um, being in the right place at the right time is, is vital. And we started to talk about, um, before last week, we kind of got a little bit off last week because of everything that happened. But um, now we're getting back onto our lesson. And we started to talk about Paul. And um, these were lessons that Paul needed to learn because there were people that he needed to know. And maturity uh, had to occur to prepare him for his calling. So whatever it is that God has for us, um, there must be a maturity that takes place in our life before that happens, or um, if there's not maturity there, when that opportunity presents itself, you, you will probably fail. It's sort of like, you know, the old saying, I guess I haven't used this example for a while, so I'll use it again. But of course, I grew up on a farm. So uh, I got to wa watch lots of animals and stuff, you know, as a little kid, and got to watch chickens and ducks and geese being born. And um, when you see the chicken, the duck, or the geese pecking their way out of the egg, what, what is your, you know, as a young child, boy, what do you think your natural response is you want to do? You, you, want to, you want to help that along, so you want to crack the shell and help that bird get out of the shell, because you, you, you just think, well, I'm going to make eat life easy for that bird. But do you know that in making life easy for that bird, do you know what happens to that bird? It dies. It dies. It dies. Because it's the resistance caused by the shell that the bird getting out of the shell is what makes the bird strong and what makes the bird live. Yeah. Is it right if I take just one little side journey here? Yeah. I just got this in my spirit. I, I don't know who needs to hear this this morning. Maybe we all do. But you know, uh, um, the same is true for our own children. Do you know that? That if we do everything for our children, if we enable them in every way that we can, um, there's no resistance in their life. If we take that away from them, when we go home, if we go home before they do, um, 
they're probably going to die because you haven't allowed life, the resistance of life, to develop them. So we can do too much. Just take that and do what you will with that. But I believe that will help somebody. So now, like Paul, what he would have chosen himself for himself and what God knew that he needed were two different things. Many of you here today, and we did a survey about a week or so ago, we had, we said, how many people here are born in Las Vegas? <laughs> Not a lot. I think we had about two or so, three maybe. But we're all transplants, right? We come from somewhere else, you know. And if you stop to think about it, when you were in the fourth grade and you were sitting in your school desk, did you ever dream you'd live in Las Vegas? No. No. So what many of you what you would have chosen for yourself would not <laughs> have been what God chose for you. And we're going to find the same thing that's true about the Apostle Paul. That God knows where we need to get to long before we do, don't he? You know, so not only does he know where we're going to get to, but he knows what we're going to need along the way as we get there. And it might be much different than what you think you need. And so in Acts, if we could look at this really quickly, and I don't want to get out of myself, I'm so ex I get so excited about this stuff, but Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, because the older that we get in life, I think the more excited we get about direction for our life because we realize we don't have that much time to make mistakes anymore. I mean, you think about it, I'm 60, almost 64 years old, so if I've lived half my life, um, I only got 64 years left. So I don't got time to go around the mountain too many more times there, and I don't really have the energy for it anyway. But Acts chapter nine, neither do some of you, right? So let's avoid going around the mountain time after time again, and um, let's get it right, shall we? Acts chapter 9, verse 3, Luke described what he knew, and um, we're going to look at some fascinating things today, about Paul's conversion. In verse 3, it says here, that, um, and as he, Saul, journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a uh, light from heaven, and um, the word suddenly here actually carries with it the idea of a surprise, a surprise. So Paul's Damascus experience to him was a great surprise. He had his life planned and it was going in a different direction as many of you may have had a different direction from your life. And um, then maybe you had a Damascus experience and your Damascus experience brought you to Las Vegas. And so um, the blinding bright light that appeared to Saul suddenly <laughs> took him by surprise. And many times that can happen in a situation, all right? So verse four says, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And we said here, do we have it, the word persecutest? Up there, I think we have it, is the Greek word um, dioko, all right? And um, it means this, a high-level hunter, high-level hunter. It's the same word used in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse... Oh, there we are. Let's look at it first for a moment. Persecuted is dioko. It means to hunt, chase, or pursue. To persecute denoted uh, the actions of a hunter who followed after an animal in an order to apprehend, capture, and kill it. So it is a hunter. Um, it's the same word we said used in 1 Timothy chapter... Uh, 
I believe it's chapter 1, verse 13. Let's look at that if we could real quickly. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 said, Who was before a blasphemer? Uh, this is Paul talking about himself. We looked at all these words. A blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious. He said, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So he was a persecutor or you might say a hunter. So by using this particular word or this particular Greek word, dioko, um, it's if, if Jesus, what he basically said to Paul was this. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you hunting me? Why are you looking behind every bush in every twig trying to take me down or trying to capture me? Now, Saul, of course, was indeed a high-level hunter, and um, the prey that he was after was Christians. Um, Saul was diligently sniffing out any scent of Christians that he could find, and his aim was to pursue to capture and exterminate believers. That was his job. In Saul's view, Christianity was a deviant form of Judaism that needed to be cleansed or um, excised from Israel. So in verse five, now Paul responds to Jesus here, and he says, who art thou, Lord? <laughs> good, good answer, right? When you have this blinding light and it, it knocks you on your spiritual keister, or literally on your keister. He said, who are you, Lord? You know, um, and the Lord answers. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, or we could say, I'm Jesus whom you're hunting. You want me, you got me. <laughs> it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The rest of the verse says, and he saw trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? How many know this is a wise statement to say to the Lord? Not, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this ministry. I'm going to go all over the world for you. Well, he might not want you to do that. So then you're on your own. So the wise man says this, or woman, Lord, what it is, or what will you have me to do? Yes. Okay? Now, we also learn that the word Lord in this particular passage is the word kyrios, kyrios, and it means this, a supreme master, one with absolute control. The only reason one would use this word would be to recognize someone as supreme master having absolute control and lordship. So when Paul called Jesus Lord in this particular verse of scripture, and it was twice in this passage, Saul was clearly recognizing him as the supreme master. Lord and master of his life. So, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Notice what it says. It says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. I'll be saved. Recognizing him as what? Supreme master. You know, many parts of, of we've joked about this a little bit, but um, many different parts of scripture, Paul actually calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is his jailer. Jesus is his master. When Jesus says go, he goes. When Jesus says stay, he stays. So it says when we call on that name, of the Lord. When we call on him as Lord, it says we shall be saved. So that's what Paul did. 
here when he confessed and believed that Jesus was Lord, in that instant, okay, Paul was saved, or if we could say, Paul was born again. So in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, now Paul looked back at this particular moment of salvation and said he, that he was actually apprehended of Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, we have that, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, not as though I had already attained, neither were perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of in Christ Jesus, all right? So you might say this, if you can visualize this, the hunter, who is Paul, is out hunting Jesus. You know, and have you ever seen one of those nature shows, you know, where, where the, some guy is out there in a coonskin cap, you know, and he's out hunting the grizzly bear and he's just walking along and all of a sudden a 15-foot grizzly bear stands up in front of him, wraps his claw around him, and now no longer is he the hunter, he is the hunted. And as a matter of fact, he's not only the hunted, he's the meal. He's the main course, all right? So that's what happened to Paul in this particular verse of Scripture here. So the word app or handed here is actually the word uh, caralambeno, and it's a compound of two words. It means something that is going downward. Lambeno means to seize or take. So when these two words are fused together, it means to seize or grab hold of something, to tackle it and pull it down, to conquer it or to master it. So here's Paul. He's out um, hunting Christians, locating them, sniffing them out, capturing them, putting them to death, doing all these things to them, and all of a sudden, the hunter now becomes the hunted. Yeah. And Jesus, you know, it'd be like one of us probably wrestling one of the wrestlers that are on TV. You know, that match wouldn't last too long. So when Paul became saved, he said Jesus literally apprehended him, he tackled him, he took him to the ground, spiritually mastered him, and he made Saul his own. Praise God, did that happen to anyone in here? Hallelujah. So all Saul could do was raise a white flag of surrender to the Lord. You know that when the Lord apprehends us, the best thing that we can do is throw in the towel oh, yeah. Yeah. and say, Lord, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Yeah. Don't tell him what you're going to do. Ask him what he wants you to do. Mm -hmm. See, many people, you don't go to God and attempt to impose their own will upon the direction that they're going to go rather than go to him and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is it that you would have me to do? All right, so in Acts chapter 9, verse 6, we also see here, um, let's put it up if we could, Acts chapter 9, verse 6, it says, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, will Wilt thou have me to do? And then, of course, the Lord tells him to arise and go to the city, and it shall be told what thou must do. So we see in Acts chapter 9, verse 6, the word trembling here is the Greek word tromos, and it describes someone who has the shakes. In other words, have you ever been so scared before that your teeth literally rattle? You know, I often, I often find it in music, Sometimes, you, have you ever been on an airplane that has a rocky landing? And boy, you know, people are partying and they're, they're, they're cracking the suds, you know, and everything. And then all of a sudden, when the plane's getting ready to land, and you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's dead silence. You know, and um, <laughs> nobody's laughing anymore. And uh, it's a very serious thing. But you know, if you're a Christian, I always say, and that plane goes down, you're going up. Amen. Right? So, no, well, that's not so bad either to be with the Lord, is it? But uh, anyway, uh, the moment Saul called.
called Jesus Lord, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside him, and instantly, everyone say instantly, instantly Saul's old nature, which was filled with hatred, rage, blasphemy, and evil, was replaced with the nature of Jesus. In other words, when he became born again, when he um, called on the name of the Lord, the love of God was now shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost. And you know what? That's the same that's true with us. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so um, the first prayer Paul prayed at his point of conversion was, Lord, what will you have me to do? The moment he was saved, recognizing Jesus as his supreme master and Lord, Paul immediately desired to know and to do God's will. If you are born again, the immediate desire of your heart should be, first of all, to know what God's will is, and secondly, to do it. So to make an act of consecration and surrender is a sure sign that a person is genuinely saved. Now, in Acts chapter 26, if we could look at that for a moment, Acts chapter 26, verses 16 and 17, uh, Paul also gives us a few details here about what happened to him on this particular Damascus experience. Acts chapter 26, we're going to look at verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, he said, but rise, uh, Jesus, speaking to Paul, he said, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, he said, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So, he appeared unto him for two purposes here, to make him a minister and to make him a witness. Now, if you haven't been with us, and I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, about verse 18, you know, we've all, everyone here to this morning, has been given the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us are called to the ministry of reconciliation. So we've been called as a minister, and we've also been called as a witness. All right, look at, for the, do we have the next one up? Thank you so much for putting that up. These guys are on the ball. I just think it, and they got it out. Let's go back to the scripture we were just at. He said in verse 17, he says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles whom now I send unto thee. Okay? And so um, in this particular passage here, Notice um, in verse 16, if we could for a moment, the word purpose. Verse 16, um, the word purpose here tells us that God had a purpose for Paul. Um, from the beginning, God didn't want Paul to wander all of his life what God's will was. May I say this to you this morning? That God does not want you to spend your whole life trying to find out what his will for your life is. Amen. Amen. May I submit this to you this morning? God wants you to spend most of your life, everyone say most of your life, most of my life. executing. Yes. Executing yes. what he showed you. Yes. Executing what he showed you. He'll show you, now if you've been born again for a long time and you still don't know what the will of God is, that's the first thing that you need to determine. What is God's will for my life? But it shouldn't take you a long time to get that. No. 
what we should be doing is spending the brunt of our time carrying out or executing that plan for our life. Can you say amen today? Amen. Okay, so um, first we see here that Jesus made Paul a minister of things that he was presently experiencing as well as a witness of what he would reveal to Paul in the future. Next, Jesus said he would deliver Paul from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, in verse 17. So, Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 16, ministering to the Gentiles was Paul's primary call for his life. So everyone here, we are all ministers of reconciliation. God clearly has a plan for our life, and he has a primary group of people for us to minister to. God has a primary, everyone say primary, and a specific, everyone say specific. He has a primary group of people and a specific place for you to be. Now it's very popular in the age that we live in, in this, the, the, the church age that we live in with modern day thinking. And we've taught a lot on this, and I don't want to get into this, about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and Gnosticism and the doctrine of Balaam and all the goofy things that have entered into the church world. But one of the very popular things that's entered into people in the church age that we live in now is many people feel that, well, I can just go to like two or three or four different churches and that's just fine. May I submit this to you? That is not God's will. If you are doing that, you are violating God's will. No, God has a specific place for you to be and plug in. As a matter of fact, you will not fulfill your destiny in life unless you're plugged in there. So I can just go wherever I want, you know, enjoy the church of my choice. Well, you can do that, but it's not going to go the way that it would for you had you been obedient. How many know that there are rewards to obedience? There's also consequences for disobedience. How many know obedience is a good thing? It's a good word. I like obedience. When people say, well, you're nobody going to tell me what to do. Well, neither is God, unfortunately. You're going to do what you want to do and have it your way, and you're going to get to heaven, and, and you're going to wish 10,000 years from now that you would have obeyed him. Because this is the only place you're going to get rewards. You're not going to get rewards when you get to heaven. You're already going to have them. If you don't have them, guess what you're going to have? Nothing. So I'll we'll be in heaven. I just want to get to heaven. I don't care about any of that. Well, maybe 100,000 years from now, when you see other people enjoying privileges that you're not enjoying, you are going to wish I was obedient when I had that chance to be obedient. Just saying. Remember, we said life on this earth is the briefest thing any of us are ever going to do. I mean, you think about it. If, if Jesus tarries for 100 years, we're all going to be dead. Most of us. We're out of here. You know, that's just a few minutes God's time, by the way. But um, the Lord said in verse 15 of chapter 9, he said, um, Go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear thy name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. God's purpose for Paul's life, his wills for him, was threefold, all right? First of all, Paul was first and foremost called by God to be a witness to the Gentiles. A witness to the Gentiles. Jesus listed this first, thus it was the top priority and the most important thing for him than anything else. Number one, Paul was called to the Gentiles. Number two, Paul was also to be a witness for Jesus to kings. So this included people in places of governing authority. And then number three, the last task 
on the list given to Paul by Jesus was to be a witness to the children of Israel or to the Jews. And it's interesting to note, and just a little side thought, that whenever Paul, <laughs> Paul took it upon himself, if you will, to because he had such a love for the Israel, do you know that? Paul had an intense love for Israel. As a matter of fact, there's a point in scripture where he said, you know, I wish all the Jews were as I am. If they could all be saved, I, could, I would gladly be accursed. Now, I love you all here, but I ain't going to hell for any of you. You want to go to hell, you go there. I'm going to heaven. How about you? So I did, but he had that kind of love for the children of Israel. So who do you think his natural temptation was? It's always to minister to Israel, to Jewish people. Do you know what happened to <laughs> Paul when he would try to minister to the children of Israel? He got the fire kicked out of him. And um, most of the time there were very, very little results because that's not the primary place God called him to minister. The primary place God called him to minister was where? To the Gentiles. What happened when he tried to minister to the Gentiles? Revival. Man, cool things happen, you know. So um, when Paul heard that his ministry was under the Gentiles, he must have went into shock. Because he came from a Jewish background. Now we said this last week, but um, you know that um, the only real thing that um, Jews had to do with the Gentiles back then was this. Gentiles were used to wash their feet. So he's looking at them and like, you, you want to talk about racism? This might be one of the original forms of it right here. Jewish people and Gentiles. They don't want nothing to do with them. I mean, they were unclean to them. And so now guess what? This is kind of humorous. The people that Paul despised and he thought were unclean became the very people that God called him to minister to. So I would say this to you today. Be very careful the people that you voice a dislike for because they may be the very people that God calls you to minister to, big boy. You better look, first of all, you should, once the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you should love everybody the same. Come on, you might as well say amen, you know? And so if you have certain phobias about certain people, you know, you know I know people that have phobia, phobias, literal phobias about people that are gay. Well, be careful about voicing your displeasure for gay people because they may, you may get called to San Francisco. So, oh, don't say that, Pastor John. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So be very careful about these things. Because the people that you're coming against, God loves those people. God loves everybody. He doesn't love me more than he loves the gays. Or he don't love them more than me. He loves us all. So. Um, Paul basically had been taught to loathe Gentiles, to hate them. And have nothing to do with them. So under the rules of his particular sect, he wasn't even allowed to sit at the same table as a Gentile. They were the scum of the earth to him. I mean, in my mind, you know, or I should say in the mind of many Hebrews, the only Gentiles were, the only thing they were really good for was to wash the dirty feet of a Jew. Now imagine the inner conversation <laughs> The likely went on in the inside mind of Paul when Jesus appears to him and now tells him that all these people that he hates and he loathes are going to be the prime focus of his ministry. 
He probably said, what? Me ministering to Gentiles? You've got to be kidding. Did I really hear God speak that to me or not? You ever had one of those conversations with the Lord? When he tells you what you're going to do, he shows you in your spirit. But because you don't want to do it, you begin to rationalize and say, well, you know, I'm not really sure that was the Lord. So you go to about three or four different people to ask them, you know, to get their opinion. And you know, then you call the local gossip chain, I mean prayer chain, that nobody else knows about. Remember, he would ask God this. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And you're calling me to minister to people I've despised all my life? How in the world could the will of God lead me to somewhere like this? Somewhere where I don't want to go. How could the will of God lead you to a city such as this. You know, if my wife and I, Dee, you know, we grew up in small farm towns, we're just farm kids, you know? And logically speaking, I could probably relate more to a hay shaker or a corn planter than I could to somebody that works in a casino. First of all, I've never gambled in my life. I've never even played, I mean, I've done plenty of other things, but, I haven't even put a quarter in the machine. I'm too cheap. <laughs> I love President Trump, but I'm not going to pay for his hotel. I'm not going to pray for Wynn's hotel, or I'm not going to pray for the other guy's hotel either. Love them all, but I ain't paying for any of their hotels. They're not getting it out of me. But yet, God. Everyone say God. God. He determines our course, doesn't he? So, interesting to speak of, but um, when Paul was um, born again, he was sent to a place called Antioch. Now, Antioch is a city that's about 490 miles north of Jerusalem, and inside Antioch was a brand new church that was unlike any other it was filled with both Jews and Gentiles who were in fellowship with one another. It wasn't just Jews, it wasn't just Gentiles. You might say this, it was a culturally diverse church. Kind of like we are. We are a culturally diverse church church we have men we have women we have just about every race you can think of that comes here and praise God for it I think it makes the stew a lot more flavorful don't you I'm glad everybody's not like me it'd be very very boring I promise you but we've got Everything here, I almost said from soup to nuts, but we don't have any nuts here. We're all soup, right? But we're good tasting soup too, aren't we? This is the home of the smart sheep, right? I like, I, I just like culturally diversive. I like, I like different people that are different than me. You know, I remember I told the story one time to Chandler, but when I went to college in Wisconsin, it was in the 1970s, and um, when I got to, to college, um, things weren't like they were now, just trust me back then. But do you know what the first thing I did when I got to college was? I requested a black roommate. It was awesome. In fact, I'm still friends with him on Facebook today. He became a Christian after I did. Because I wanted to learn about people that were different than I am. Praise God, we've all got an attribute of God. 
that not everyone has. So, this particular church with these, <laughs> with uh, the de it ha had Paul not got out of Jerusalem, his way of thinking would always have been the Jewish mindset and it would have hairlipped, if I can use that term, his call for ministry. Because who was his primary source to minister to? It was the Gentiles. So how do you learn to minister to the Gentiles? You have to be around Gentiles, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't know how to minister to them. So he had to go to a culturally diverse church. I often thought, you know, why in the world? I, I thought back, well, why when I went to college, why did I have it? And I wasn't even a Christian at the time. Well, I just had it in my heart to, I wanted to have a black roommate because I wanted to live with somebody like that and experience their way of life. And I would have never thought in 1975, that what year are we in now, 2020? That I'd pastor a culturally diverse church, that all that stuff I learned in the 1970s help, would help me today to understand other people. Isn't God wise? Is, is he not smart? So it was in Antioch that Paul received a true vision for the body of Christ. It was in Antioch that he learned how to put away his prejudice and loathing and to love Gentiles. May I be very honest with you this morning? If there's one thing that ticks me off. It's when I see somebody thinking they're better than someone else or someone that's prejudiced towards something, someone else because they look differently than they are, because maybe their skin is different than they are. You know what? I It, it ticks me off. I think it just... It grieves the Spirit of God. So. Because guess what? We're all going to be in the same heaven together. And if you don't like me now, why would you ever want to go to heaven? And if I don't like you, why would I ever want to go to heaven? Because we're all going to be there together. I always say this. If you don't like church now, you might as well not go to heaven because... Be a lot of church in heaven, lots of listening, lots of learning, lots of teaching. Okay, so it was in Antioch that Paul came to that place in Christ where there is this there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, and if I could add to this, black, white, Hispanic, American Indian, Filipino, you name it. There is none of it in Christ. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a race in Christ. We're either in Christ or we're not. Two races of people. I believe that with all my heart. Praise God. But Paul, from his upbringing, was prejudiced. So, the way God got him over that was he brought him into the church where the Gentiles were. Now he's got to sit next to guess who? A Gentile. Someone that used to just wash his feet. Now he's sitting next to that person. And he might even have to minister to that. What, you want me to pray for? Ugh, unclean. Look. He had to get over all these prejudiced mindsets. Because his primary ministry was going to be to the Gentiles. It was necessary for him to be in that place for him to go to the next level of ministry in his life. I wonder this morning, as we're talking about some of these things, you might be examining your own heart and saying, God, why do you have me here? May I submit this to you? 
it's necessary for you to go to that next place that he has for you. It may be go into all the world. It may be in this very church. You're not here by accident. None of us are. If he's our Lord and we're his prisoner, the best thing we can say is reporting for duty, sir. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. We want to take a moment and pray. Not just for people in our congregation, but for those that watch us on the internet, we get different messages from people that see us from all over the world and watch our services because some parts of the world, you know, um, they can't preach the gospel clearly. Did you know that? If they catch you watching a gospel program or something, they'll cut your head off. So we're being a blessing to people, not just here in Las Vegas and not just you guys, but we're changing lives around the world. Amen. So let's take a moment if we could. I don't know everyone here today, but you say, you know, I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And, and I need to, to make him the Lord of my life. Is there anyone here with an uplifted hand say, Pastor John, I need you to pray for me at all. If we're all saved and born again, that's cool. All right. Well, then we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask Dee to come up with me here, my helpmate. Praise God. I'm going to pray. We're going to pray right now together for you that are watching and for anyone here today. Would you pray with me today? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Your word said that when we call on your name, we will be saved. So we call on the name of Jesus is the Lord of our life. We believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead for us. And we call ourselves saved, healed, delivered, set free from this very moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We love you guys. Stand to your feet if you could. Grab the hand of next to somebody. Uh, praise God.
Christmas, people.